My guest, Todd Coconado, was a child actor in Hollywood. Is it as bad as it's portrayed to be? I would say in many ways it's worth. There's a lot of things, and I think a lot of these things are coming out. This I understand, because the same thing was going on with me. You were pulled into politics. I believe persecution is coming. You know, we're getting uh, threats. I'm willing to stand, I know you are, but you know, what hill are we gonna die on? You had an angelic visitation. In that time, I had never had anything like this, but there was an angel that was right there at the end of my bed. It was so real. I felt the tangible presence of the Lord. The first thing that happens is you're paralyzed with fear, but then I knew that it was holy, it was of the Lord. When I felt that peace come upon me, say two things. I'm sorry, I have to stop you right here. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Go and flow. What did this angel look like? I know what angels look like by artists, etc. What did this real angel look like to you? Very large, I would say, uh, as tall as the room could afford. Uh, we have body foot, you know, tall ceilings. It was the entirety of the room. Um, you know, it looked like a warrior. You know, I could tell that it was an angel. I could tell just by the glory and the presence of the Lord. And you know, chiseled face, uh, man. Obviously, when you're in that moment. And, and, you know, it's like a shock. I mean, you're just trying to absorb everything that's happening. And so, you know, this is what was going on. Was this the first time or if you had this previous? In that time, I had never had anything like this. I was sleeping in bed with my, my daughter was a little baby at the time and then my wife and, and I felt the something, you know, and so I, I believe I was awake. I could have been sleeping, but it was so real. But there was an angel that was right there at the end of my bed. And, it, you know, in the Bible, it says when you see an angel, you have an angelic visitation. The first thing that happens is you're paralyzed with fear. And I will attest to that. That's how I was fearful at first. But then I knew that it was holy. It was of the Lord. And so when I felt that peace come upon me, say two things, say come out from among them and be consecrated. Come out from among them and be consecrated. Then as quick as he came, he was gone. Why did you have this visitation? So this is very important. And this would uh, come to define the next couple years, okay? Because I was a pastor. Uh, I was already uh, living what I thought to be a consecrated life. I'm like, what is this message? Come out from among them, be consecrated. What does this mean? And what I believe as I prayed on this Sid extensively and sought the Lord's face is that God is coming back for a church without spot nor wrinkle. He says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And I believe that he's preparing his bride in this time. I think there's been a lot of shenanigans. I think we can all agree in, in the last 30 years uh, in the church. And I believe right now the call, it's always been the call, but he wants us to consecrate ourselves. I believe he wants us to operate in, in holiness. He wants us to have a desire to live a righteous lifestyle. And so there were areas, there were alignments in my life. There were things that I didn't even realize that as I sought the Lord, he started peeling away layers and showing me different things. And uh, I, I began a consecration process unlike anything I've ever walked through. I've interviewed you before. Yes, I really can feel a tangible increase mm -hmm. in the presence of God. This is all glory to God. This has nothing to do with me, but it's, it's in obedience to answer this call, which I believe he's calling all of us to do in this hour, because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So he's looking for an open door to accuse the saints. But as we consecrate ourselves, and I'm not saying we ever attain perfection, but our desire as a believer is to do our very best and to be like David, be a good repenter and have a heart for the Lord. And as we do this, the anointing has increased in our meetings, Everywhere we've gone, we've seen a tangible difference. There's there's something that's happened where to the point where people have reached out and said, uh, Todd, I don't know what's going on, but I, I sense something different in you. And I believe that's because as you go deeper in the Lord, the Lord reveals himself. And, you know, it's an expansion of the territory for his glory. This I understand because the same thing was going on with me. You were pulled into politics. Yeah and you started feeling uncomfortable in the on the inside. And not that it's wrong for a, a true believer to be involved in politics. They should for the sake of their family and their nation and their city. Uh, however, it became 
too much emphasis. So what did God show you about the main thing? There's a lot to this. So something can start off good. And I believe, like you said, we as believers need to occupy all mountains of influence. We need to be influencing that culture is the downstream of the church. So, it, you know, the reason why we're seeing a lot of the moral depravity and the things that we're seeing today is because we haven't addressed these areas. And I believe there's been a vacuum. And when there's a vacuum, wickedness comes in. So we do need to speak to the political mountain. It's very critical. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but here's what happened. Something can start off good. Okay, and then what happens is it starts off like prophetic. You know, you could you could give a lot of prophetic words that the Lord's giving you, but if you make too much of an emphasis on that and you get away from the leading of the Holy Spirit, there's something that started off good can be bad. And that's in any area. I can I can speak to deliverance that way. I can speak to anything. So with the political, it's the same. So what happened was, and I, I think you have experience in the same area too, is because I was as a pastor speaking politically and because many pastors weren't, I started getting calls from all over the country, including from the administration at the time, saying, you know, will you speak on these matters? So what happened was, you know, talk shows and radio shows and everybody was reaching out. And I believe it was effective and, and the Lord was being glorified. But then I started getting into the swamp, Sid. And, you know, I think flesh started coming in and I, and I got off of the main thing, like you said. And so one night, my wife and I, and this is after many, many appearances at state capitals and all different types of political rallies and you know different prayer gatherings, again, fruitful. But what happened was my wife and I are sitting in, in bed one night and the Holy Spirit spoke to her and, and, and it resonated in my heart and, and to me as well in this conversation. And she said, honey, she said, you know, we're getting uh, threats. You know, the news media is coming after us about some of these stances and I'm willing to stand. I know you are, but you know, what hill are we going to die on? And when that was said, it just resonated in my heart, Sid, because what happens is, see, I believe there's a lot of persecution. Excuse me, would yes, you sir. repeat the statement your wife said? It's so important, that statement, please. Yes, she said, what hill are we going to die on? And, and we were having this conversation and this is, it, it, I'm telling you, I'll never forget this moment because I, I believe persecution is coming. We're already seeing an uptick of persecution around the world. Many of our brethren are being persecuted. But as this happens, see, I have no problem as a minister of the gospel. If they want to take me out for the gospel, I'm good with that. I've already been stabbed nine times. You know, <laughs> it, that, that, that is a hill I'm willing to die on, Sid. I'm willing, if, if they're going to come after us, yeah. and they are to some extent, but I think we're going to see more of this in the future. But I don't want to die on the political hill. I don't want to die in the swampy hill for, you know, being an apologist for a, a candidate or a political movement. My job as a believer, and I believe all of our job as a believer, is to stand for righteousness in this hour. And many of these matters, by the way, that they call political, like a abortion or, uh, you know, the murder of the innocent, you know, these are spiritual matters, but we have to speak these matters boldly, but we can't die on the hill of politics itself. We have to stand for righteousness and for the entirety of the word of God. And like the apostle Paul, who was another man that was persecuted and yet went out and what did he do? He went out boldly under the anointing and the unction of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe God is raising up a standard in this hour of ministers at David's and Esther's that he's raising up now, but we're going to, we're not going to die on the hill of politics. We're not going to die on the hill of anything carnal. We are going to stand in this hour for righteousness. We are going to be empowered and on fire for God. And I believe it's a buffer, Sid. I believe right now, even though there's many wicked plans, there's many wicked plans and there's many different agendas and many different things that could happen. But I believe that we are a buffer. The body of Christ, the church, the ecclesia is the buffer to these wicked plans. And they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to, what is it that's stopping these things? Why is it that, you know, we're still here? What's happening? But I believe this is all part of God's plan for a great end time harvest of souls. Your life is fascinating. It should be a movie. I have an image of Hollywood from the movies. Yeah. Is it as bad as it's portrayed to be in real life? I would say in many ways it's worse, Sid. Uh, there's a lot of things, and I think a lot of these things are coming out. We can get into some of it, but you know, uh, we've seen like with Harvey Weinstein, the Nexium cult, all these things that have been revealed in the last few years. These are things that we've known for many, many years. The, the sexual so, perversion. Yes, yes. And I, I think the Lord spared me of this because I got out of it at 17 years old and some of my friends experienced some of these things so i have close friends that experience these things i know it to be real and i know it to be true 
How in the world did you become a child actor? Were you really gifted? And and uh, how would they even know you're gifted at a young age? You know, I think it was a lot to do with my mom just meeting the right people that said, you need to get involved in being an actor. You're here in Los Angeles. We honestly didn't really know what we were doing. We had just come from Cincinnati, Ohio. I, I supposedly was told I have the look, Sid, whatever that means, the look. We got a really good agent and manager, and that's very important when you're in Hollywood. Our manager was somebody that was really, uh, you know, connected to a lot of the studios and the and the big wigs in Hollywood and so that opened a lot of doors for me at a young age to get principal roles and roles on a lot of the shows at that time but I believe the Lord was ordering our steps because I think we needed to know some of these things that were going on that we would later then speak about in the ministry so God knows what he's doing but at that time I think we were quite innocent we didn't really know what we were getting into the movers and shaker in Jewish households is the mother is that true in Italian households too? <laughs> well, and my mom has the best of both worlds. So her father was Jewish and her mother was Italian. <laughs> so uh, I would say yes. And she uh, definitely took the best of both of those. And so she she has the chutzpah. Uh, she definitely did and still does till this day. She's a powerful woman of God. You must have really ate well to <laughs> have Italian and Jewish food all combined. That's better than Chinese food. <laughs> okay, you're, you're hitting on something here, uh, Sid, because that's true. And what it did is it spoiled me for Italian food and for Jewish food, For you know, in the restaurants. it's We're very uh, picky because my mom, she would take the time with the sauce. You know, if you're Italian, you know what I mean. And uh, the sauce was like a full day affair, you know, just making the right sauce, getting the meatballs right. So, yes, she's a very good cook, and so is my grandparents. Your mom was a practicing Catholic, and one day her life was transformed. Yeah. She heard the audible voice of God. Yes. What happened? Yeah, my brother had croup and pneumonia, and he was in the hospital, and it was looking like he could die. He had to be trached because he couldn't breathe. And so when, the, when she was in the car, there was no one else with her, and she felt a hand on her shoulder, and all of a sudden she heard an audible voice say, I'm going to heal him. This was something that rocked her. She didn't quite know what just happened, but she knew that God was revealing himself to her. And what I believe this was, Sid, was the Lord was starting a healing ministry. It was starting at that time, and I believe he knew that we as a family would say yes to the call. And all glory to the Lord, this is all his doing. So they become pastors and uh, they they drag you. I think I have the word right. That's they the right drag word. you yeah. to Honolulu, Hawaii, which didn't take a lot of dragging right. for a pastor's convention. And you're in the middle of the convention and it's, you use the word chutzpah. How did you have the chutzpah to run out? <laughs> I thought I was going to get struck by lightning. You know, here, here I am, a guy that's living in a very secular, very worldly lifestyle. And all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of a, a very powerful movement, uh, you know, meeting with a bunch of pastors. And I felt the tangible presence of the Lord. And this is important because I started sweating. I didn't know what to do. The only thing I could think of is get out of this meeting, run. So I go outside to this Descanso garden. It was like a movie, Sid. I felt like a beam of light coming down on me. And at that moment, I got on my knees. I didn't really quite even know fully what I was doing, but I accepted the Lord Jesus into my heart. Two years later, at age 21, this sounds like a movie, Todd, by the way. At age 21, you're stabbed nine times, once in the heart, you die, yeah. um, I, but you're here, yeah. what happened? Well, this is quite a remarkable story. So for two years, I was in what I call limbo period. I would go to church, but I came out of Hollywood, remember? So I was totally uh, a different type of person that I was going to a very conservative church. And, and it was just like, I was a fish out of water. After two years of being a Christian, I go back to my old friends because I hadn't made any friends and the enemy was in my ear. And I said, well, what's it gonna hurt? One day, you know, I go back and there's a man that I believe was on um, several drugs. He was out of his mind and I opened this door and uh, he, he has a kitchen knife in his hand and he proceeds to stab me nine times. One of them was in the heart. Now, uh, this is a long story, I'll make it real short, but he picks me up because he realizes that he's gonna be a murderer. He picks me up, he puts me into my vehicle, he takes me to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, as you mentioned, I believe I died. I went in the presence of the Lord. It was a white presence. And I heard the audible voice of the Lord say, do you wanna live or do you wanna die? And I said, I wanna live. He says, if you live, you gotta be sold out for me and you gotta tell people that I'm real. 
when I said yes, and it's like an Isaiah chapter six moment, you know, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. I was in the presence of the Lord. And what do you do at that time other than say, send me? Yes, I mean, of course, you know. So I said, yes, when I said yes, I woke up in the hospital. There was a police officer and there was a nurse and the nurse looked at me and she said, you should not be alive. And the police officer said the same thing. Uh, a person had died that night that had gotten stabbed two times. I got stabbed nine times and by the grace of God, he allowed me to live. And I believe for the purpose that we're talking about today. I wanna go back to a statement you've made because it, it grabs me so strong. And I think it's God wants to use it to grab people that are viewing right now. And the question was, what hill do you want to die on? And even a greater question than that, do you absolutely know in your heart that if you breathe your last breath, you will be present with the Lord? Do you know that? Yes. And yes. if there's any question, I believe there's a presence of God on this broadcast that if you will repeat this prayer and mean it to the best of your ability, you will go to a place far better than here only when you finish your destiny in your book of life. Repeat this prayer out loud. Mean it to the best of your ability. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. I ask Jesus to live inside of me. I thank you, Jesus, that your blood washes me clean and pure and righteous and holy in your sight. I thank you because of your blood. I have no past. I only have a wonderful future that is written in my book of life. I make you not just my Savior, but my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Todd, I want you to pray whatever the Holy Spirit is inspiring in you for our viewers. Thank you, Sid. I feel this strongly. There's a lot of folks that are watching. You may have been hurt in a church. You may have church hurt. Uh, there are reasons why the enemy, for whatever reason, got in there somehow. Something, something somebody said to you, something somebody did, and there's been an offense. There's been a hurt. And uh, there's a lot of people online right now that are saying a lot of different things. And I, I believe the Lord is calling us as a body of Christ to get back to the main thing. We talked about it earlier. And so what I wanna pray today is that there's a release and a healing. We have to heal. The hour is extremely late. I think it's the end of the end times. And not to, not to be scared, that's a good thing. God has called us for this hour. And so we were, we were, we're a chosen generation for this. What, a, what an amazing and extraordinary time to be alive. But I wanna pray right now for the hurt and the pain, anything that you've suffered or that you felt to go away and that we would serve an audience of one because I, I come in agreement with that prayer that Sid just prayed. So let's just pray that, Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, I just feel so strongly, Lord, that somebody is getting a healing right now of being hurt and wounded. Something somebody said, something something that happened to them and that you are drawing near to them. You're calling them to a deeper walk in this hour. We want to die on the hill of righteousness. We want to die on the hill of your word, on truth, Lord God. It's the truth that sets the captive free. And in this hour, Lord, this is what we need. We got to be fired up, more, more on fire than ever before. And so I pray for this person that's watching right now that the fire, the flames of revival would start in their heart right now. And they, they would be passionate, Lord. There is a message that you put in the hearts of many of these folks. There is a passion. There is something. And right now, I believe it's an activation. There is a, an activation moment that is happening. Something has happened. On my best day of preaching, I can't make you feel anything. The Spirit of God is moving right now. And so we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that today is the first day of a new season, that they're walking into a promised land season, and there is an activation, and that, that hurt and those wounds are now being healed in the name of Jesus, because you are the healer. And so we just thank you for fresh fire, fresh anointing, and a season of depth. We're going to die on the hill of righteousness, in Jesus' name. As you were praying, I heard that people that have problems in their back and their neck 
if you will take a corresponding action. Why? Faith without corresponding action is dead, or faith without works is dead. Uh, if you have a pain, move your body where it normally hurts, and you'll see the pain is gone in your back. And it's also, if you have a neck ache, just move your neck and you'll see, you'll move it right into your healing. And people's fingers that have uh, maybe arthritic type of conditions, that's gone in Yeshua's name. It's so strong in backs. Do not miss this moment of your visitation. Todd, thank you so much for being a guest. And I'm looking forward to what God's going to do with you. The best part of your life is ahead of you. Amen. Thank you, Sid. It's an honor. God bless you, sir.